What are 13 ways that RIAs have an unfair advantage? That is today's question on the Transitioned RIA question and answer series. It is question number 75. Hi, I'm Brad Wales with Transition to RIA, where I help you understand everything there is to know about why and how to transition to the RIA model. Uh, if you're not already there, if you start by heading on over to transitiontoria.com, uh, you can find all of the resources I make available. I have this entire series in video format, uh, podcast format. I have articles, I have white papers, all kinds of materials. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, podcast, if you're watching this in video format and you prefer podcasts, uh, just search for the Transition to RIA podcast on all major podcasting platforms and you will find it. Again, all the resources at transitiontoria.com. Okay, speaking of articles, which I mentioned are on the uh, website there, you can find the various articles I write. Uh, I wrote one recently uh, in an industry uh, uh, periodical, and it talked about some of the unfair advantages that the RA model has over other affiliation models. And I wanted to go ahead and make an episode here on this topic as well. Uh, so I'm going to be going over 13 examples of that. Uh, and, and I love analogies. So the, an analogy I would use for this is imagine you uh, are going to play a one-on-one -on -one basketball game against someone else. And you, you both have the same equipment. You both play by the same uh, basketball rules. You're on the court, all, all that stuff. But uh, you have to voluntarily play with one hand behind your back. Your opponent does not. Uh, would that be fair? Would that be a fair matchup? Would you even have a chance against someone that can, that can play with both hands? And you'd say, well, no, that's not a fair matchup. And I would tell you that is that analogy applies to a lot of how advisors can compete in the marketplace against their other fellow advisors. And so that's what we're going to be talking about here is, are you that one-handed basketball player or are you able to play with two hands? And so kind of to, to extrapolate that on that further, what we're going to be going over is, is some of those differences that advisors in the RA space, what, what tools and resources and strategies they have available to them that other advisors and other affiliation models have, in some instances, have no access to. And so the, the challenge is you as an advisor are out there competing in the marketplace against other advisors that are in the RIA model. So if you're not in the RIA model and there's certain things you can't do, and I'm gonna give you some examples, and you are competing for clients, both new clients and to retain clients, and you're competing against advisors that do have access to those things, you are playing a one arm basketball game against your opponent. Uh, they have an unfair advantage just because of the, 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 the way they have set up the practice and what they have available to them. So I want to give you some examples here on today's episode. And these are in no particular order, but, uh, but I do have 13 of them uh, that, that will kind of just uh, run right through. So the first one, uh, and, and I'm going to kind of present these as a tale of two advisors. So we're going to talk about, okay, one advisor can do uh, something. The other advisor cannot do that thing. Uh, and, and you'll see how we go through it. So the first one, one advisor can make a podcast uh, to, uh, among other things, try to reach prospective clients with. So if you are listening to this as a podcast and you are an advisor, you obviously understand the value of podcasts and the popularity of podcasts. People are listening to podcasts. So as an advisor, if you're able to have a podcast, that gives you one more channel to try to reach prospective clients, to be able to demonstrate your expertise, to be able to get in front of that audience. Uh, and, and advisors are able, there's a subset of advisors that are able to do that. And then there's another subset that are not allowed to. Their firm will not allow them to have a podcast. And maybe it's because the firm has no way to, uh, or feels they have no way to properly supervise that activity or to, to be able to monitor what you say in the episode. So they simply say, you cannot have a podcast. So again, we have one advisor that can have a podcast that can reach prospective clients with it. The other advisor, not allowed to have a podcast. Okay, number two, one advisor can make videos uh, demonstrating their expertise and put them out into the marketplace. The other advisor, not allowed to make videos. And, and I uh, obviously, I'm a believer in videos. If you're watching this in video format or you've seen my videos, I, I believe in the power of video uh, uh, and, and how effective it can be in, in, in getting yourself out there, demonstrating your expertise, proving your trustworthiness. 
Um, and so if you're an advisor and you're able to make videos, you have the ability to connect those dots or you're an advisor that doesn't have that, you are at that disadvantage. Uh, and I, I've heard this a number of times, but a very specific example, I absolutely talked to an advisor or helped an advisor uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, and he was at a captive firm. I won't name the name of the firm. He wanted to make videos to demonstrate his expertise, to, to kind of show what he can help clients with. Uh, and he went to his firm and he said, hey, I'd like to make these, these short little videos and they're going to be in different topics and, and whatnot. Uh, and the firm basically came back to him and said, hey, here's, here's, the, re here's the result uh, of your request. Uh, making videos, there's no regulatory thing that says you as an advisor cannot make videos. Um, we actually trust that you know what you're talking about and trust that you wouldn't say anything uh, irresponsible in those videos. Uh, but here's the problem. We have thousands of advisors at our firm. We have no means, at least currently, to be able to monitor thousands of advisors making videos because some of them might say things that we're not comfortable with. So by default, we have to say no to all of you. And, and, and so that's the classic manage to the lowest common denominator. He was told he couldn't do it. He is competing against advisors or was. He's actually since made the move to his own RIA in part, not in, not in total, but in part because he wanted to make videos. And he absolutely is now making videos for all the reasons I, I stated it can be an advantage. So another variable to consider. All right, number three, this is one that I think is uh, very important to advisors to be able to do. Uh, so if, if it's a volatile day in the market or there's big news that comes out that moves the market or could move the market, uh, in our tale of two advisors, one advisor has the ability to that very day draft an email, perhaps providing some talking points, some comfort to their clients and send it out to their clients, either most or all of their clients in bulk. Send one email, gets that message out there, says, hey, I'm paying attention to this stuff. I'm thinking of you. Here's some takeaways from that. One advisor can do that. The other advisor doesn't even bother because they're, 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 the compliance at their firm says, oh, hey, if the email is going to go to more than whatever their numbers, 15 recipients, it has to go through our review process. By the way, our standard turnaround that on is two, three, four, five, six, seven days, whatever the case is. So you as or that advisor knows, OK, by the time I get this sent back to me, hopefully approved, the message is already already moved on. Uh, the, again, the, 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 it was timely. It was based on the facts of the day you wanted to get that message in front of clients. So in our example, one advisor is able to do that. The other advisor doesn't even bother trying because they know there's just no chance they're going to be able to turn around quick enough for it to be an effective email. That's a big difference from a, from a satisfaction standpoint with, with clients and be able to work with your clients. One advisor can do it. One advisor cannot do it. All right, number four, uh, one advisor can respond to media inquiries uh, if, if someone from the media or an industry periodical or the local newspaper, or the local news, whatever, reaches out and wants a quote, wants perspective, one advisor is able to, is able to freely quote, freely uh, give their opinion. And, and by extension, that's another way for them to get their name out there, build their brand, build their firm in the marketplace. The other advisor, not allowed to do that. The firm they're at has a corporate policy that says you cannot talk to the media. You need to defer any requests that might come your way to our corporate PR team. They will answer on our behalf. You can understand that that is a brand building exercise for one advisor. It is absolutely a, a dead end for the other advisor when that opportunity comes along. Again, big difference there. Uh, number five, uh, one of our two advisors can use uh, software tools like Calendly to help schedule meetings. And the other one cannot use simple tools like a Calendly or a, or, or similar type schedule and application. And, and I, I think this is a big deal uh, because I, I'm a believer, I happen to use Calendly, although there are other versions of that. And from an efficiency standpoint, that makes life significantly easier, both for yourself and your clients to be able to at least offer it up if your clients wants to come meet you or a prospective client, as opposed to maybe going back and forth, leaving voicemails, is you at least give them the option. They might not, they might not take you up to say, hey, here's a link, click on this, pick a time that works for you. And you set it up to, to work within whatever your calendar constraints are. Uh, it's a huge efficiency standpoint. Calendly has been around for the Calendly or the other versions of it have been around for years now, and yet there are still some firms, and it's for it's for they have uh, concerns over the the security of the tool or the technology, or the data from the calendar or whatnot. So they say you cannot use that. 
even though these things have been around for years. And so you, again, tailor to advisors. One advisor can make things so much more easier for the prospective clients and regular clients. One advisor cannot use a simple software tool that has been around for years. So another example of a tale of two advisors. Uh, kind of extending on the technology, uh, that, that was kind of just the, the Calendly. Um, but uh, our tale of two advisors, one advisor can go out in the marketplace, no matter whether it's something uh, efficiency type thing, like a, a, calendar, a calendar schedule, but can go out in the marketplace and look at all of the fintech solutions that are out there, whether that's something for efficiency, whether that's something for client reporting or risk an uh, analysis, whatever the case is, one of our two advisors can go out there, look at that entire universe and use whatever they want to use. Now, there might be some logistics of like, you know, can it integrate with my CRM or whatever the case is that you work through? But as long as it's available, as long as the advisor likes it, likes the value proposition, likes the price point, and they can work it into their their, their kind of workflows there at the uh, at the practice, they can do what or use whatever they want. The other advisor can only use the technology that their firm has either built themselves, proprietary technology, or is on an approved list that they have narrowed down from the vast universe of fintech solutions out there down to a very narrow subset of here are the only specific solutions that we approve you using. Yes, this person over here can use the entire universe. You can only use this small handful of technology tools. So again, a, a big difference in a tale of our, our two advisors. Uh, number seven, uh, another one that hits home for me because I, I do this myself. So one advisor can have a, or start a blog to demonstrate their expertise, demonstrate their knowledge, give uh, prospective clients particularly a chance to see that you can provide value to them before, before uh, asking that, that they come and, and maybe meet with you or talk with you. The, the kind of the world we're living in now that, that more and more prospective clients in whatever industry they don't want to just blindly pick up the phone and give you a call. They don't want to just blindly come and meet you. They want to see first on their own time without any commitment. They want to see first that you potentially can help them, that you know what you're talking about, that you have the expertise to be able to help them. A blog is a wonderful way to demonstrate that expertise, give someone on their timeline, their comfort level, a chance to look at, at what you're put it out there from a content perspective and decide at that point whether to follow up with you. That has become in all industries a bigger and bigger uh, um, component of how you market yourself, your business development strategies have to get content out there. So if one advisor, tail to advisors, one advisor can make a blog and put this, this uh, their expertise out there, their knowledge out there, the other advisor cannot make a blog. Or if they can make a blog, they're told, oh, the company has uh, pre-made articles for you. And yes, we will let you choose from our catalog of these wonderful pre-made articles and you can post them to your blog. The challenge, of course, it's painfully obvious that those articles are all not written by the advisor. They're written by some marketing team. It's painfully obvious that that same article is being used by who knows how many other advisors. There's no thought leadership being demonstrated there. That is just a copy paste. It's actually, I would argue, the opposite of, of being beneficial because it just screams either I'm not capable of making my own content or I'm not able to make my own content. So I'd rather just, just cut and paste this in here and attempt to, to pass that off as, as a demonstration of my expertise. So again, tailored to advisors, one can make a blog, can put that content out there, that, that personalized content they have made. The other one either can't do anything at all or has to use only canned commentary, which screams not made by the advisor. Okay, number eight, yeah, if you make these videos, if you make these podcasts, make these uh, uh, blog articles, whatever, then you might wanna kind of get your message out there. So one way people work to get message out is on social media. So to our tale of two advisors, one advisor can use whatever social uh, media accounts they want to use. If they wanna use Twitter, they can. If they wanna use LinkedIn, they can. If they wanna use TikTok, they can. They can use whatever they want because they are controlling their own process for that. Our other advisor is told exactly which accounts they are allowed to use and which accounts they are not allowed to use. And of the ones they are allowed to use, it is also monitored most likely by some big brother software that will, that will arbitrarily even sometimes delete uh, tweets or posts or whatever you've made 
without your knowledge, uh, because you put it out there, the software deems something in that, some word verbiage or whatever phrasing you've used to not pass their filter, then not only will they essentially reject it, it will automatically delete it from your account. So again, this is your personal account. This is your personal social media account that, that some advisors are forced to run through some system. That system, that big brother system gets to decide whether you are worthy of making this social media post on your own account. So again, one advisor can use whatever social media platforms they want, no big brother involved. One advisor has to go through everything I just described, much different experience, much different uh, ability for the advisor to get their message out there to prospective clients and clients alike. Uh, number nine, uh, one advisor can offer pretty much any fee schedule to clients that they want to. Now, I don't want to say any in the sense that there are some kind of defined norms that you, you can't, you, if you have an AUM fee, you can't charge 7%. The regulators will take issue with that. But the idea is from the structure of it, whether you want to charge AUM fees, retainer fees, monthly fees, hourly fees, whatever the case is, our tail to advisors, one advisor can, can structure their, their fee schedule or their service offering to clients using whatever fee schedule they would like to do. Now, there's certain disclosures they have to put out there and there's logistics to get all that set up, but they have that available to them. If they want to use an AM, AUM fee schedule with maybe most of their clients, but there's some subset of clients where it makes more sense to do hourly or flat fees or monthly or whatever the case is, they have the entire universe to choose from for what is best for, for their value proposition, their service offer, and the kind of clients they support. What are those clients and how are those clients able to pay? One advisor can implement it with, with complete flexibility. The other advisor is told, no, as a firm, we have decided for you, these are the only few ways that you can charge your fees. These are the maximums you can charge. And oh, maybe you, you do want to do hourly. Or you do want to do, yeah, we, we don't allow that. Or by the way, we might have some cumbersome process. And, and so you're not, you're not even going to want to do that. So again, tail to advisors. One can tailor their, their service experience and pricing schedule to their audience. The other is limited by what their firm, their, their corporate firm says here is solely what you are allowed to use. A big difference uh, between those two options. Um, the next one, number 10, this is as an advisor, if you believe in outsourcing your asset management, so, so many, many advisors, that's part of their value proposition is they manage the assets themselves, they have models, they, whatever your strategy is, but then there's a, 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 another large subset of advisors that say, nope, you know, that's not part of our main value proposition. We, we do the financial planning, uh, we do the, the relationships with the clients, uh, all kinds of services, but we rely on kind of third-party solutions, whether that's an SMA manager or a, a managed model or whatever the case is. So on our tail of two advisors, let's say they both believe in outsourcing money management, uh, our tail of two advisors, one advisor can go out there and utilize any accessible managed asset managed solution that is available out there. So when I say uh, accessible, because they have to have a way to maybe facilitate the, the integration back and do the trades and all that stuff, uh, which is pretty common with most, uh, most of the big applications. But the idea is, so assuming you can check that box, you can go out there and you can say, hey, I, I like what this firm offers, or I like how this, this firm over here does it, or I like how this firm prices their, their managed solutions. There's our tail to advisors. One advisor go out there and utilize any of those they'd like. And again, assuming they can integrate it back in, they have access to use whatever managers they like, whatever solutions they like, whatever platforms they like, they have available to them. The other advisor is told, nope, uh, we only allow these particular curated uh, managed solutions that we have the firm has decided is what's worthy for you and worthy for your clients. And, and yes, to be fair, they probably pick some good solutions in there, but make no mistake, it is only a small subset of the solutions available in the marketplace. And again, that's mostly for a supervision reason that they feel we can't have our thousands upon thousands of advisors all using different things. Uh, so the only way we can supervise is to really narrow this all the way down. And this is all you can, as advisor, this is all you can choose from. So again, a tail to advisors, one has mostly the entire universe of options out there to choose from. The other, a small curated list that they have pretty much no control over uh, of what goes in or out of that list. Um, number 11, we're almost done here. Number 11, a tail to advisors. One advisor, in addition to kind of your traditional maybe financial plan and an asset management services, 
One advisor, if they wanted to, could also offer uh, additional auxiliary services. And so maybe that's accounting services or tax planning services or insurance services. Uh, and yes, as your own RA, there's certain disclosures you have to make about that and then how it's positioned. But, but you have the ability to incorporate those services into your practice. You can do those things. Or other advisor that's maybe at a big, large firm says, nope, uh, you, you, you definitely cannot do tax planning. Uh, you, you definitely cannot do any formal accounting for them. You, you, uh, you might be able to offer insurance, but again, it's limited to what we decide you can offer. So from a, from a value proposition, again, tail to advisors, one advisor can go out there and if they want to, many advisors don't, by the way, have any interest in adding some of those auxiliary services. But if you did, uh, an example would be this, uh, I hear often advisors kind of want to offer more and more family office style services and more more broad spectrum of, of, of uh, services to support higher net worth families or even, or even not even super high net worth families that just expand that set of services. Again, the other advisor is, is much more constrained on, on the, the amount and breadth of services that they can offer their clients. Um, number 12, tail two advisors. One advisor can work with clients of any size they want to and can charge a, uh, to, to work or get paid, I'm sorry, and, and to get paid to work with clients of any size. The other firm is limited in that. So this is actually timely. I'm making this towards the end of the calendar year. You see a lot of the big wirehouse firms doing their annual uh, compensation updates. Don't get me started on that. I can make a whole episode ranting about that. Uh, but an often tweak that you see with some of these very large wirehouse firms or brokerage firms is, oh, if, if, if the client is under a certain dollar amount, and by the way, every year that dollar amount seems to, to grow higher and higher. If the client is under that dollar amount, advisor, yes, you, you can still work with them. We just won't pay you. You will have a 0% payout on that or maybe a very reduced payout on that. And so they're essentially penalizing you for working with smaller clients. And yes, maybe you don't want to go out there and work with a lot of clients with very small amounts of assets, but they're inevitably are circumstances that all advisors come across where it's in the, right. The classic example is that, that, that physician, that doctor, that's not very far out of, uh, out of medical school now is making a very nice income uh, as a long-term client could become a very good client as, uh, as they save over the years. But as it stands right now, they're not that far out of medical school. They don't have a huge asset pile, but you would like to work with that client and over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years could become a very large client for you. But yet your firm is telling you or, or for this tail to advisors, the firm says, yeah, we're actually not going to pay you to provide any services for that advisor. You just try to try to catch them down the road when they have more assets and you, and you as that advisor just have to hope that no other advisor like our other advisor comes along and actually can help them through that period of time and they will earn that long-term business and the other advisor won't, won't have a shot at it. So again, a big difference tail to advisors. One can work with clients of any size and get paid on it. Uh, like I talked about earlier, maybe you have to come up with some more creative ways that you charge for your services, retainer or hourly, but there's a way to get paid. The other advisor uh, limited uh, or, or maybe not paid at all or reduced payout depends on the size of the client. All right, uh, let's see, last one. Uh, number 13, kind of wrap up, and this is not a capstone one, but it just happens to be the last one. Uh, one advisor or tail two advisors, one advisor can make a custom website uh, demonstrating all the things I've been talking about here. Maybe they, they can show their videos they can link to their podcast. They can have that blog. They can have all that content. They can specify exactly how they are unique and different uh, and, and what they can do for clients. Uh, that's one advisor. Is it? The other advisor, nope. The other advisor has to use the templated website that their firm provides. And yes, there's a few variables that you get to change. You get to put your name at the top and maybe you can wordsmith a few things. But let's be honest. Your page looks the exact same as thousands of other advisors' pages. It's undifferentiated. Clients can see right through that. They go to that on, well, on the chance they even go to it because it's probably like some sub page of the main company's website. It's not even a custom domain. And if your clients happen to get to that, again, it screams, this is a canned templated website. It's no different from the thousands of other advisors on here. That is not going to impress any clients. That's not going to make them want to take that next step with you and reach out and say, hey, 
this person can really solve my unique needs. Again, at that point, you arguably or likely haven't demonstrated any of that. You haven't been able to put content or videos or podcasts or however it is you want to show your expertise. Instead, you just have this canned templated website. So uh, again, a tale to advisors I got through this. I keep saying, okay, one advisor can do all these things. One advisor can't, can't do any, or if the ones they can do, it's very limited. And you might think, okay, hey, Brad, I don't have any interest in having a podcast that's not my thing, or I, I don't like making videos, or I don't want to make videos. Uh, that's fine. I'm not suggesting you need all 13 of these things. What I am suggesting, though, is there are advisors out there in that RIA space. If you have your own RIA, and there's some wonderful options that you can join RIAs that still have this flexibility, you can do all 13 things in the RA model that I just described. They're all available to you. So the question is, you might say, well, I don't want to do all 13 of those things, or I don't feel I need to do all 13 of those things. That's fine. But the reality is there are other advisors out there that have access to all of that, and you potentially don't. If you are at a wirehouse firm, a traditional brokerage firm, or anything that constrains you from maybe being able to do most, if not all of these 13 things I just described, just keep in mind your competition. There are other advisors in your town, maybe across the street from you, you are all trying to attract similar clients. If one advisor has access to all 13 of these and you maybe have access to none, again, maybe you don't want to do all 13, but maybe you want to do some of them. Just is that a fair competition or are you playing basketball with one hand tied behind your back? I think it's very hard to compete against someone that has a far superior advantage of how they can attract clients and work with their existing clients. So just something I want, I hope you keep in mind, again, the analogy, you'd never want to play basketball one-on-one -on -one and you have to tie one hand behind your back. The other person doesn't have to. Uh, for some of you out there in the marketplace, that's effectively what you're doing. You are, you're because of the circumstances, because of the type of firm and model you're at, you are being forced to tie one hand behind your back. Your, your competition, the other advisors that, that you're out there in the marketplace with, do not have to. They have much more flexibility as they, as they talked about on today's episode. Uh, so if, you, if there's any of these type of items that you'd like to dig into further, uh, this is the sort of thing I help advisors with is understand what can you do in the RAA model? How does it work? What options do you have? How would you implement these sorts of things? And how does it vary or differ from what you maybe have now? So I'm happy to have that conversation with you as well. Uh, like I said at the top, my name is Brad Wales with Transition to RIA. Uh, the next best thing to do is head on over to transitiontoria.com. Again, you can find all of the resources I put out there to help you better understand the RIA model. I practice what I preach. I put content out there. I put a lot of content out there. I believe that I wanna demonstrate that I can help you learn this subject. I can help you understand how it would apply to you. Take a look at all that content. Uh, and then if you wanna take it one step further, uh, at the top of every page is a contact link. Just click on that and you can instantly and easily schedule a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me to talk about today's topic or anything else RIA related. I'm happy to have that conversation with you. Again, transition to RIA.com. You can find all of the videos, podcasts, articles, white papers, all of the resources there, transition to RIA.com. And with that, I hope you found value on today's episode and I'll see you on the next one.